Uh, let's welcome Andrew for, from Harmony, a peer-to-peer -peer lender in New Zealand. I'd like to introduce you to Harmony. Um, we're a new peer-to-peer -peer consumer credit platform uh, setting up initially in New Zealand um, and then maybe branch into Australia. Beyond that, who knows what. We're an experienced team. Um, a lot of us have worked together before over a couple of instances, uh, twice in fact, and in those other consumer lending operations, we have generated over a billion dollars of shareholder value. Um, what I'm going to do today is tell you a little, about, a little bit about the banking situation in our home territory uh, and the $12 billion opportunity that we see in there. Um, we are about launch, subject to regulatory approval. New legislation came out in New Zealand on 1st of April, which explicitly enables peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, so we're going to be a part of that. Um, and lastly, I'm going to show you some of the attractive returns, which we expect lenders will be able to get in New Zealand. Um, but first, uh, I'm, the, I'm the analytics guy. I'm the geek in the company. So what I'm going to do is show you a little bit of a research project we've been working on, um, which is about the mission of how you can globalize peer-to-peer -peer lending and investing and measure risk across borders. The concept is this. What if an investor in California, say, wants to invest to fund home improvement loans in Australia? Or money in China? wants to fund a wedding in New Zealand, or likewise, someone wants to take their money from Jakarta and fund secured auto loans in Brazil, for example. What I'm going to do is look at some of the infrastructure that's required to support that type of approach, um, some of the hurdles that remain, and highlight in particular one approach of measuring risk across geographies. So I'm first going to explore the case for globalizing peer-to-peer -peer lending. Now, I do acknowledge that this is done. It tends to be done at an institutional level, and it tends to be done within close economic domains, like the European Union. Um, but the vision we have is to be able to extend this worldwide. Um, also, look at our New Zealand situation and so on. The Economist magazine in a recent article said this, the economics of international banking are straightforward enough, raise funds where it's cheap, lend it where it's expensive. Um, and that's very true. And the banking world has been doing this for many years. But there's a different model that the existing banking system has. Um, for a start, they've got a vast asset base. They are in a number of countries and they've also got a vast infrastructure to support this. Just by way of indication, I had a look at the number of employees for the top five international banks in the world. That adds up to about 1.1 million employees just in those five banks. And that's, that would be half of the entire working population in New Zealand. Um, now, I think when it comes to peer-to-peer, -peer, we're not looking we're not aspiring to create that sort of infrastructure again. Why globalise P2P? I think for the borrower, it's a clear case that you're going to get cheaper capital. Um, just by way of illustration, these are the typical interest rates for OECD countries. New Zealand there towards the left is that black bar. So we are experienced at having moderately high interest rates. Um, we're not sort of Greece, Iceland high, but it is quite high. USA tends to be down the bottom. Uh, frugal Germany, quite modest down the far right hand end. For the investor, it's really a diversification play. Um, this really speaks to some of the fundamental tenets that go with peer-to-peer -peer lending. Diversification and risk and opportunity. So the investor's got a an opportunity to take a bet on an economy which is not their home economy. They can exploit differences in GDP, they can exploit exchange rate movements, or choose to hedge against those if they want. But what do we need to do to 
get to this point? Uh, there are a number of things. Um, clearly, there's a credit issue. We've got to be able to assess credit meaningfully across domains, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. There are a number of features which are required around the, the legislation environment that supports this. So I don't think anytime soon this is going to go universally worldwide because you need, you need an explicit legal authority to be able to operate in this way. Um, a lot of these features need to be present in lender country, uh, borrower country, and platform country, if that's going to be a third country. You've got to have protection in law for creditors. You've got to be able to know that you can get that money back. Um, and a few fundamentals dealing in finance. You've got to have AML protection, uh, protection against financing of terrorism. Uh, and lastly, the free movement of capital. And it goes without saying, you've got to have a good platform, international support for multi-currencies, multi-languages, and all those things that you're going to encounter. I'm just going to briefly get into the, some of the science of this and scorecard development, which is one of the things that I do. The conventional approach to developing a scorecard is that you have a number of factors about the applicant, um, information that you get from the credit bureau, Possibly you might tie in macroeconomic factors like the exchange rate, uh, the unemployment rate, and so on. You find your statistician or your data mining guy, they apply their favorite algorithm. At the end of that, you get a, uh, a nice sharp differentiation between goods and bads and the ability to rank customers when they come in. Now, um, this is all very well. The output of this is being able to set risk grades. And from risk grades, you can set pricing and interest rates and so on. But the kicker with this is that you need the history behind this. So just as an example, lending club here and time from origination of the loan to eventual default for those loans which do default, um, you see you've got to wait at least a good year, 18 months, before you see even half of the defaults that you're going to see. Now, what this means for scorecard development is that you have to have that substantial history, two, five years um, to be able to develop that. So what I'm going to look at is an approach which can help us get there when you haven't got quite that same degree of history um, when you're going into a new country, a new domain, for example. Now, getting back to any credit application form around the world, they will ask for common things. And one of those things is your employment, how long you've worked uh, at your current job. What I've done is take some data from different countries. So here we're looking at New Zealand data as one line, um, a couple of the platforms in the US, and a German data set. This is looking at one particular feature, which is the time an applicant has been um, employed uh, at their current job and how that relates to their um, level of default. And uh, good customers tend to be up here, bad down here. Now, the thing about this is that these basically all operate the same way. So you see for um, people who have only been in their job one, two, three years, um, they tend to be bad risks. Uh, people who have been there three or more years tend to be good risks. And that cutoff point does tend to be about um, three to four years. Now, what this is telling us is that there is a universal characteristic that Essentially, people, lenders, uh, behave in quite a similar manner around the world. Here's another example. Um, when we look at residential status, again, over those same country sets, we see the same sort of pattern. So if you compare um, people who own their house or have got a mortgage versus renters versus people who are getting their accommodation subsidized or provided for free, consistent pattern throughout the world. Um, now, it turns out there is a bit of theory behind this. Um, back in the uh, traditional approach of credit lending, you might hear about the, the five C's of lending, things like character and capability and so on. Now, this is where it all comes together. This guy here, this is Sewell Wright, he invented this approach, which is known as structural equation uh, modeling. 
Now, he's a, a, a very brilliant statistician. He also did a lot of work in genetics. His particular field was inbreeding. And um, just a side note, that's kind of interesting because his own parents were first cousins. Go figure. Um, anyway, uh, how does this come together? So you've got to measure like employment duration, which we saw. You might have something else like residential duration. These are measurable factors. You've got something, one of the five C's, you think stability might be something which is important in the character of an applicant. Quite true. How can you test this? Now, stability on its own is unmeasurable. There's no stability measure. You've got to use things like employment duration, how long you've been at the address to measure that sort of thing. So the statistics of this comes in that if you see a relationship, a correlation between a couple of factors that you can measure, and you think the theory is that they also relate to something else, um, you're away. You've now got the fundamentals of developing that equation to relate your, um, your unmeasurable factor, one of your five C's, and that received wisdom tends, to be, tends out to be quite good, in fact. And now you can create a formula which links that down to uh, what you really want to know, which is how it hooks into goods and bads. And that's the basis of it. Now, the second thing is, how do you compare apples with apples when you're going across countries? Um, and that turns out to be quite a simple approach. These are um, three different situations. We've got uh, a FICO score. FICO is basically a risk grading. Um, Lending Club have got their own grades, A1 through to G5. Uh, in our own situation, we've got a similar set of grades which follow the same sort of scale. So how would you know that an applicant with a certain grade or a certain FICO score, are they similar to the same guy in Lending Club or Germany or New Zealand or whatever? Um, basically, you boil that down to something that is consistent. So in the vertical axis here, we've got the odds of default, an odds ratio. So 10 to 1, your probability, probability of default is 10%. Um, that's where these orange lines are, just to give you a consistency. So for that um, FICO score, what we're seeing there is about a 780, 10 to 1 chance in a personal loan portfolio. Um, that equates to about a B2 or a B3 in Lending Club. Um, for us, that comes into about an E5. So now you've got a mechanism that you can compare similar um, or, or different rating scales and boil that, that down to the same thing. Um, I think there's a great opportunity for some of the information exchanges like Orchard and so on to, to do that. Um, all right, I'll just quickly wrap up, um, talk a little bit about our own platform, what we're doing, what New Zealand is. Uh, New Zealand, fundamentally, we make Peter Jackson movies. Um, but the rest of the time, uh, we sometimes grow a bit of stuff, and that's essentially what it does. We're an exporting country. It's reasonably stable. Um, we've been doing that for years and years and years. Our banking situation, however, is uh, a little bit different. It's not particularly open. We've got a a four-pillar policy which we inherit from Australia. The banks collectively have got a very high market share um, and it's a very concentrated market. A consequence of this is they've got margins between borrowing and retailing that you can drive trucks through. So we see this as a fantastic opportunity um, for us to get into with a more efficient model and the P2P model just um, you know, nails that perfectly. So, um, look, in summary, we're getting together. We've done this before. We expect that we're going to have some reasonably uh, good default rates based on what we've seen before. We've got some good credit scoring, and we know that market quite well. Our previous successes have been pretty good. Um, the first time we got together as a team, we created 100 million in value. Um, that was in good times. Second time, uh, developed nearly a billion dollars with shareholder value and that was through the global financial crisis. Lastly, what we're expecting in terms of what we're going to offer to, uh, to lenders on our platform, 
This is uh, just sharing with you what we expect is our population distribution across the grades, the gross interest rate, which is scaling pretty much from 10% up to about 40% in range, and net returns, net of defaults, and uh, uh, our usual fees and so on in that range, kind of 10% through to 24%. So quite a good story. Um, this is in a context where the best you could get in New Zealand for certificate of deposit is only about 5%. So, in conclusion, I think there, there is something there, that ability to, at a retail level, go offshore and to globalise your peer-to-peer. Um, your -peer. um, I think there are some good things. I think we've got a good story to tell about the New Zealand environment, and uh, we can get some good returns. So, that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you.